Well, I'd encourage you to have your Bibles open in front of you at that passage that we have just read together a moment ago earlier in our service in Romans and chapter 1. Romans and chapter 1. And this morning, as we continue to work our way verse by verse through this letter of Paul to the Romans, we come to verses 24 to 27. So that's Romans chapter 1, verse 24 through to verse 27. And the title for this morning's sermon is, Are These the Most Hated Verses in the Bible? Are these the most hated verses in the Bible? For these verses speak to us clearly, plainly, quite directly about homosexuality. There's no escaping that. That's what these verses are talking about. You cannot skirt around it. You can't gloss over it. You can't evade it. The subject matter is obvious. And I'm not going to pretend that these verses don't exist. I'm not going to jump over them or sidestep them. We're going to look at them because we're working our way through Paul's letter to the Romans. And this is what is next. Now, these verses of the Bible are hated by some people in our world today. If you were to ask people which verses of the Bible they hate the most, I think these verses might be near the top of that list, although there is some tough competition for the top spot. If you're a cosmologist, no doubt you hate the Bible's verses about creation. If you are a feminist, no doubt you hate the Bible's teaching about male leadership. If you are a pluralist, no doubt you hate the Bible verses that teach about the exclusivity of salvation through Christ alone. And just about everyone hates the Bible verses that teach us about hell. But there are also people who hate the Bible's teaching on human sexual ethics. You only have to look at what happened to Kate Forbes in recent weeks. Now, if you don't know, Kate Forbes is a member of the Scottish Parliament. Um, She has been the finance minister for the Scottish government and when Nicola Sturgeon announced that she was stepping down she said that she wanted to be a candidate to be leader of the SNP which would make her first minister of Scotland but she's also a member of the Free Church of Scotland which is an evangelical denomination and so her opponents and I have to say the mainstream media have been continually asking her about her beliefs but particularly her beliefs about sex They want to know what does she believe about sex outside of marriage. They want to know whether she supports gay marriage. They want to know what she believes about the transgender issue. And they haven't really been interested in her views on poverty or health care or education or industry. They just want to know about her views on sex. You know, people say Christians, you Christians, you're all obsessed with sex. But in reality, it's the world that is obsessed with Christians' beliefs about sex. And of course, the situation for Bible-believing Christians is made all the harder when the official state church, the Church of England, recently voted to bless same-sex unions. Now, the church insists it hasn't altered its official doctrine on marriage, but it's obvious to to anyone that it has done just that in practice if not in writing but the Church of England's decision it it further isolates faithful Christians who are trying to live according to the Bible's teaching on human sexual ethics and of course those of you who are parents and who have school-aged children you'll know that this past month has been LGBT history month where children Um, take part in all sorts of activities to celebrate lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender lifestyles so that we have drag queen story hours in public libraries. In fact, there's an ongoing legal case at the moment because a four-year-old child was forced to take part in a gay pride event against his mother's wishes. 
And on top of that, here in church this morning in a gathering of this size, here in this room, and those of you that are sitting next door in the church lounge, there may be some of you that struggle in this area. Some of you may be attracted to people of the same sex. Some of you may have previously engaged in same-sex experiences. And some of you may have friends, family members, colleagues, people you know who are living in a homosexual lifestyle. How do we handle all these complexities in the world in which we live? Now clearly these are contentious, controversial issues within our culture. And so that means, yes, we need to handle these issues with wisdom, <coughs> with grace, with patience, with composure. But we should not shrink back from declaring what the Bible says. If we love God, we love God's commandments. All of them. Not just some of them. Not just the ones that are easy and popular we also have to love the commandments which may be difficult and contentious so then let's look at these verses this morning under four headings first of all I want you to see where these verses start where these verses start then secondly we're going to look at what these verses say what these verses say then thirdly, I want us to think about what these verses mean, what these verses mean, and then fourthly and finally, what these verses require, what these verses require, where these verses start, what these verses say, what these verses mean, and what these verses require. First of all, then, I want us to look at where these verses start. Now just look at verse 24 with me. Look down at your Bibles and read the opening word of verse 24. The opening word of verse 24 is the word, therefore. Therefore. It is a connecting word. It is a link between what has just been said and what is now about to be said. And whenever you see the word, therefore, in the Bible, you ought to ask yourself, what is it, therefore? What is the connection? What is the link that is being made here? And this is important because the verses we are considering this morning, verse 24 through to verse 27, they don't just come out of thin air. They haven't just landed here in Romans chapter 1 out of the blue. There's a context. There is a flow. There is a progression. There is a build-up to these verses. So where does it start? Well, look, the Apostle Paul begins the chapter by introducing himself and saying he's been set apart for the gospel. And then later in the chapter he says that he serves God in the gospel. Later he says he is eager to preach the gospel. Then he says he's not ashamed of the gospel. And why is he not ashamed? Because it is the power of God for salvation for all those who will believe. But salvation from what? So Paul has to go on to say, well, look, the wrath of God is being revealed. Salvation from the wrath of God. For the wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness and all the unrighteousness of those who suppress the truth, says Paul. Paul says, look, the divine nature and eternal power of God it is clearly seen in creation. You only have to look at this amazing world in which we live to see the nature of God. But, says Paul, people have rejected God. They have exchanged the glory of God for the things of this world. For the idols of this world. What's the biggest idol in this world? Self. Living how I please. Doing what I want. Not having God tell me what to do with my life and my body. That's the biggest idol there is. The idol of self. So let me bring you back to the verses we're looking at this morning, verse 24 to 27 of Romans chapter 1. And this is where these verses start. They start with the fact that people everywhere have rejected God. 
They've exchanged the glory of God. They've got rid of it. They've traded it in. And what have they got in return? The idols of this world. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. It starts with the rejection of God. It starts with a suppression of the truth. It starts with a denial of the inherent glory of God. And if you look at a society that has embraced the LGBT agenda, you'll see that long ago that society rejected God. If you look at a church denomination that embraces the LGBT agenda, you'll see that long ago that church denomination rejected God. If you look at a so-called Christian individual who has embraced the LGBT lifestyle, you'll see that long ago they rejected God. That's where it starts. That's where it begins. That's the root of the problem. It is a suppression of the truth, a denial of the divine nature, a spurning of the glory of God. That's where these verses start. And that's why these verses begin with the word, therefore. Therefore. And this is also why this is not an area that Christians can compromise on. This isn't a subject where we can strike a bargain or do a deal or meet people halfway. Because it is all linked to the nature of and the glory of God. It's rooted in his glory, in his attributes, in the truth of God. If you compromise on those things, then you are really just throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But that's where these verses start. They start with the word therefore and it's there because it starts with the rejection of God. But secondly, let's look at what these verses say. Let's look at what these verses actually say and all I want to do is walk you through these verses and just be very clear about what these verses are saying. Now these verses make it abundantly clear that homosexual practice is a sin. That has been the teaching of the church for millennia. The only legitimate expression for human sexual intimacy is when within biblical marriage of one man to one woman for life. So that means, therefore, that all sexual activity outside of marriage is a sin. And that includes fornication, that is sex between people before marriage, or adultery, which is unfaithfulness in marriage or the viewing of pornography that is also a sin lustful thoughts in your mind are also a sin and as these verses make clear homosexual practices now let me take you through some of the words some of the phrases that Paul uses in these verses he uses the phrase lusts of the heart Lusts of the heart. Well, that means a desire or, or a strong longing for something that is sinful or immoral. He uses the word impurity, which means a state of moral uncleanliness, especially in relation to sexual sin. He talks about people who dishonor their bodies, which means that they do things with their bodies that are shameful or disgraceful. And Paul goes on, he talks in verse 26 about dishonorable passions. Again, that means shameful or disgraceful sexual desires. He says it is contrary to nature, which means it is the opposite of how we were created to be. He says in verse 27 that men are consumed with passion for other men. That means they're inflamed, that they're burning with desire. He talks about men committing shameless acts with other men. That means indecent behavior. That's what these words, that's what these phrases mean. 
Now I'm very much aware that this is strong medicine. Especially in our culture today. You know, I'm very much aware that there are some activists who think it ought to be illegal to say these things, to preach these things. I'm very much aware that there are those who think I ought to be arrested by the police and charged with a crime for preaching the Bible's message on this. But this is what the Bible says. I can't pick and choose. I'm not here to stand before you preaching my own message. I'm here to bring you the Bible's message. And this is what these words mean. This is what these phrases mean. But these verses, they say more than that. These verses say more than just telling us that homosexual practices are sinful. These verses also tell us that God gave people up to such things. These verses say it twice. In verse 24, God gave them up and in verse 26 God gave them up and what does that mean what does it mean to say God gives people up to these things well the phrase used by the apostle Paul literally means to hand them over or to deliver them over now it's more than God just allowing people to go their own way it's more than God just saying look if if you want to reject me and go your own way okay I'll let you because that's that's passive that's God just passively letting people do their own thing but it's it's more than that God actually actively hands them over like you would hand over a prisoner God hands them over he has actively delivered them over God is actively abandoning people to these practices. And you may say, well, why? Why would God do that? Why would God actively hand people over to things that he says are wrong? Well, the answer is given to us in verse 25. Just look at verse 25. Read verse 25 with me. In verse 25, the Apostle Paul says, because... So God handed them up because... They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. In other words, people would rather serve the creature, which means themselves. That's what they want. That's what they desire. Than the creator. It's a love of self at the end of the day. It's a love of self-determination. A love of self-gratification rather than a love of God. I love me. I want to live my life. I want to do the things I want to do. I don't want to listen to God. I don't want to know what God has to say. I don't want to live the life that God wants me to live. I want to live my life. So God delivered them over to it. God gave them over to it. That's what these verses are saying. They are telling us that homosexual practices are sinful. But more than that, that God gave people over to such things because they loved themselves. They loved this world more than they loved him. That's what these verses are saying. And it is because we live in a culture that has drifted so, so, so far from God that these verses are among some of the most hated verses in the Bible. So we're looking at Romans chapter 1 verse 24 to 27 and we've looked firstly at where these verses start. They start with the rejection of God and we've looked secondly at what these verses say. They say very clearly that homosexual practices are sinful and that God has given people up to such things. But now let's look thirdly at what these verses mean. What do these verses mean? Well, it means that human sexual ethics are not a side issue. You know, some Christians say that. They say, ah, oh, look, all this stuff, it, it's not important. This isn't vital. This isn't crucial. We needn't major upon it. 
We should not let it distract us. Let, let's just pretend these verses and verses like it don't exist in the Bible. Now, such Christians, they, they don't necessarily deny it, but they just keep quiet about it. They just never talk about it. And they think that they can fly under the radar because these things, they're not really important, are they? But I don't see how they can say that given what Paul says here. The verses we are looking at this morning, they're not tucked away at the end of the letter, are they? They're not hidden away using ambiguous or unclear language. They're right in the opening chapter of the letter. They are front and center. You know, Paul goes from talking about his great eagerness to preach the gospel to then talking about the wrath of God that is being revealed to talking about human sexual ethics. For the Apostle Paul, this is not a side issue. This is not a small thing. You know, elsewhere, the Apostle Paul says, we should flee from sexual immorality for every other sin that a person commits is outside the body but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body that's 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 18 in other words sexual sin it is in a category of its own now yes all sin is sin the Bible says if we if we break one bit of God's law we have broken all of it but sexual sin is especially dangerous because it's a sin against yourself as, a, as well as against others. It's a sin against your own body. If you commit sexual sin, you're playing with fire. You know, one of the sadnesses of our modern age is that it has convinced everyone that sexuality and sexual intimacy is no big deal. You just treat it as a recreational activity. It is a big deal. People's lives get ruined by dabbling in this stuff and getting it wrong. If you commit sexual sin, you're playing with fire. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27 to 28. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not get burned? Or can he walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? You can't play around with this stuff. Sexual sin is not a side issue. Now, you personally may not be tempted by same-sex attraction, but all of us are vulnerable to sexual sin in one way or another. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, to even look at someone lustfully is to commit adultery in your heart. So men, be careful what you look at. And young people, you young adults in the church, do not be in a rush to be physically intimate with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. And to both men and women, I would say, be careful the situations you place yourself in. Guard your own hearts. Watch your actions. For sexual sin, it is not a side issue. It's a big deal. People's lives have been ruined by playing around with this. Churches have been ruined by playing around with this and thinking it isn't a big deal. What else do these verses mean? Well, they mean that a culture or a denomination or a church or a Bible college or an individual who embraces the LGBT agenda has already drifted a long way from God. You know, we live in a culture today where it's almost impossible to go to the city center or to turn on the television or to open a newspaper or to even watch a football match or to send your children to school without having the LGBT agenda always presented to you. And those of you who work in the public sector, who work in the health service or in education or in the civil service, you know what I'm talking about more than any of us <coughs> our culture has drifted a long way from God but it's not only our culture that has drifted our churches our denominations the church of Scotland the church in Wales the Methodist church 
the Church of England have all, to one extent or another, accepted the LGBT agenda. But are you surprised by that? You shouldn't be, because decades ago they abandoned the Bible. Decades ago they gave up their belief in the virgin conception. Decades ago they gave up the belief in the resurrection of Christ. Long ago they gave up the truth of the glory of God and exchanged it for a lie. Decades ago those churches started worshipping the creation rather than the creator. But even within so-called evangelical denominations and churches there are moves to water down what the Bible really says on the topic of human sexual ethics. So there are moves to promote what is called the, uh, the same sex attracted Christian movement. Which is to say some Christians wish to define themselves by their desires. So they say they live celibate lives. They don't engage in any practices, but they still want to be identified as and thought of as a gay Christian. Now, I have to say, I think that is unwise, very unwise. Now, yes, I certainly understand that some people, some Christian people may struggle with same-sex temptation. And such people deserve our love, our support, our prayers. But to label people as gay Christians, I think that only confuses the situation. I mean, we're all tempted by different things. Other Christians may be tempted by fornication or by adultery or by pornography, but I don't think we would ever want to call them fornicating Christians, adulterous Christians, porn Christians. We never identify people in that way. If we're truly Christians, there is only one identity that matters. That's our identity in Christ. Christian. We're either a Christian or we're not a Christian. We don't need to put any other labels on it. And we also need to be very careful about distinguishing between temptation and desire. Temptation is not sinful. But desires, desires can be sinful. You know, temptation is the opportunity to sin. But desire is a yearning to sin. Christ was tempted. Christ was tempted in every way, yet he remained without sin. Christ experienced temptation, but Christ never had any sinful desire in his heart. So it is not enough for someone to simply say, well, yes, of course, I've experienced Desires, but I've never engaged in any actual sinful activity. Because the desire itself, the yearning itself is sinful. Jesus says with regards to adultery, if you have desire in your heart, lust in your heart, you've already committed the sin in your heart. And the same is true for every other sin. Don't confuse temptation with desire. Temptation is not sinful. We all face temptation. Jesus faced temptation. Temptation is the opportunity to sin. But desire is the yearning for it. Christ never had sinful desires. But we do. And they're sinful. Let me bring you back to Romans chapter 1 verse 27, uh, 24 to 27. What do these verses mean? They mean sexual sin, it is not a side issue. We cannot just ignore it. It is linked to the glory and reality of God. It also means societies, churches, and individuals who have embraced a sexually immoral lifestyle have already drifted far from God. And it means we have to guard our own hearts so that we don't drift into sexual sin. So we're looking at Romans chapter 1 verses 24 to 27 are these the most hated verses in the bible maybe we look first at where these verses start they start with the rejection of god we have looked secondly at what these verses say they say that homosexual practices are sinful and that god 
has given people up to such things. We've looked thirdly at what these verses mean. We've just discussed all of that. So let's look fourthly and finally now at what these verses require. What do these verses require? If I had to choose one word, it would be this. Jesus. These verses require Jesus. Only Jesus could save a person who has drifted away from God. Only Jesus can intervene in the life of someone who has served and worshipped the creature rather than the creator. Only Jesus can save someone who has descended into a life of what Paul calls dishonorable passions. Let me read to you from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. So this is a letter he wrote to a church in the city of Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 and 11, he said this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. That means don't be fooled. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, says Paul. Such were some of you. But you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, there... In the church in Corinth, there were Christians who had committed all manner of sexual sins. And some of those included homosexuality. But Paul says, but such were some of you, past tense, were. He says, you have been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified. And how? How has that happened? How have they been made clean? How have they been set apart as holy for God? How have they been declared innocent? Well, Paul tells us, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, there must be a sanctifying and justifying work of Christ in our lives. In the lives of men and women and children. Without that, there is no hope for anyone. And that means we have to carry on preaching the gospel of Christ. We have to tell people about Christ. We've got to proclaim the name of Christ. We've got to urge people to come in repentance and faith to Christ. And we do it in all humility. And we do it in all love. For none of us can be proud or arrogant or self-righteous in any of this. <coughs> And why? Well, because of exactly what the Apostle Paul says, such were some of us. Such were some of us. Anyone here in church this morning without any sexual sin at all? Anyone here in church who has never experienced sinful sexual desire? Anyone who's never had any impure thoughts? Or lustful yearnings. Maybe some of you have done far more than that. We have fornicators here. We have adulterers here. We have viewers of pornography here. This morning. None of us have got any clean hands. None of us are pure. So don't be proud about this. But if we have repented of our sins and turned to Christ and cried out to him and trusted in him, then we've been washed. Washed. We've been sanctified. We've been justified. And in that we rejoice, not in ourselves, but in Christ and what he's done for us. And it should make us humble then, shouldn't it? 
and modest and self-effacing. There's no room for any pride here or arrogance or self-righteousness for Jesus will not allow it. Pride comes before a fall. So then we're looking at some of the most hated verses in the Bible. Romans chapter 1 verse 24 to 27. And we've looked first of all at where these verses start. They start with the rejection of God. We've looked secondly at what the verses actually say. They do say that homosexual practice is sinful. And that God has handed people over to it. But what do these verses mean? They mean that sexual ethics is not a side issue. It's not a little thing. And that people who have embraced a sexually immoral lifestyle have drifted a long way from God. What do these verses require? Just one thing. Jesus. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord our God and our loving heavenly Father, as we close our worship, we confess our sins but we also rejoice in the redeeming work of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us not to be ashamed of your word. Uh, we pray that we will proclaim it honestly, truthfully, with courage, but also with humility and with love. We ask, Lord God, that you might forgive all our sins and help us turn away from a life of sin and to to live a life that is pleasing to you. And we ask that the righteousness of Christ might cover over a multitude of our sins. And we ask it in his precious name. Amen.